Okay, so it's all downhill from here now. That was the high point of the talk. Um, I won't dwell a lot on, on our history. It's a very checkered one. I will write a book about it one day. You'll find it in the comedy section of any good bookstore. It was basically a car crash company. We had a renegade CEO a few years ago. I was, went in as chairman in 2014. Out of that business, we actually discovered that they developed a little bit of software to help one of our clients manage their desk space. That's where this business originated from. Um, we ended up selling the, we restructured that business and we ended up selling our cabling and infrastructure business um, last year. Um, we got about 21 million for that business, about pro, net proceeds of about 16 million. We're basically using that money to reinvest in the business and to re, re, reshape ourselves really as a pure play software company. So very, very checkered history and uh, we'll make good reading someday. Makes me depressed other days, but uh, it's been a, a, an interesting journey. But ultimately what we are now is, um, is, is a pure play software company. Um, we've got an experienced board. I was chairman up until July of, on June of last year. Um, I stepped in as uh, CEO. Um, Guy, uh, Guy Van Zwanenberg is, um, is, is stepped up as chairman. He was an aide um, through the, the sort of turbulent times. Um, Bruce um, Morrison, who would have been with us today, but he's had to go back to the office or something out. He joined as CFO back in November. And in the last um, half of last year, we've basically just built out a very strong C-suite team. We appointed Alex Rem as a CTO. Um, we've brought in uh, Steve Batten there to head up implementations. So we've actually gone from, I suppose, what you could best describe as a jobbing agency type software development house to one where we want to build industrial strength sort of software solutions that we can crank the handle and roll them out to lots of customers simultaneously. What we do is, as described in, the, um, in, in, the, uh, in that video, um, we've got um, two levels of technology, one that we sell to mid-market and enterprise, and we, we sell that as smart space. Now that's a single platform. We currently got seven modules, just like you saw in that video. A, cli a client can take one of those modules, they can take all of them. It's one of our USPs. We're one of the few, one of the only players, I think, in the market that actually has a fully integrated solution on a single platform. And that's a big differentiator for us. We also operate a very open structure. So linking our products to different panels and different sensors is very easy. Most of our competitors are focused just on their own branded hardware. We've decided to be hardware agnostic and that actually wins us quite a lot of business. We're about to add a, a, an eighth module at the end, uh, sometime later this year, um, which is events management. Um, we've just deployed um, our solution into RBS and Bishopsgate. They've got a new area there called level three and they've created this workplace environment of the, of the future. And there, they've got a big events meeting uh, event space. And if you go to one of their events, sort of come the autumn, the invite will be sent to you from our software. It's our software will get you in through their gates, their speed gates. You don't have to go through reception. You'll be checked in by someone using an iPad with our software on. And when you look down the corridor, the 300 desks in that corridor are managed by our software. Okay, so it's that type of customer we work with when we work at the sort of mid-market to enterprise end. Now, there are two legacy bits of our software business. Um, we were in retail, and when I, I, last time I did this talk, I talked about us having three technologies, retail, hospitality, and workplace. Hospitality and workplace and, and retail are very much secondary to work, workplace. Workplace is really where our future lies. Um, we decided that towards the end of last year to get out of retail, so we're not going to sign any more new customers. We've got two cornerstone customers for that product right now. One is Milton Keynes Shopping Centre and the other one is a Shopping Centre in Munich. We're going to see those out, but we won't write any more. The big challenge we had there was um, retail are hard to sell to. They themselves got their own problems. And the other issue we had is that there was quite a significant opportunity cost. We had quite a lot of resource um, deployed there that f freed up about six or eight people in the business that we've redeployed across onto Workplace. The hospitality business is interesting. Um, now for hospitality, it's basically events management. So it's like that product we're going to add in the summer for our sort of uh, our, our, our end users. But this one is aimed at the, at the hospitality, um, corporate hospitality seller. Now our one customer for that platform uh, up until uh, recently was STH. They've got the franchise for corporate hospitality packages for the Rugby World Cup. So if you bought a package from them, it's actually our software, even though it's STH branding, you, you see. We did one deal on it last year, um, um, and it's with Compass Group, and it's with their subsidiary, Keith Prowse. And Keith Prowse, they have the franchise for managing Wimbledon, for example. So if you go to Wimbledon next year and you say, I want to book 10 seats, and I want uh, printed 
uh, t-shirts and I want um, afternoon tea, you'd order it all on our platform. From our perspective, it's a very uh, contained piece of our business. There's only two developers actually involved in supporting and developing that product and it doesn't require any of our implementation resource. So unlike retail, there's no opportunity cost of selling it. I expect we'll do another one or two deals on that platform, but it sort of runs itself. And our view is if it's making us money, let's keep it there. But all of our energy now is in workplace. We also operate at entry level. I'll talk about the customer profile in a second, but that's very much what we do at the mid-market and, and enterprise end. We, under, we operate under two brands, Smart Space, as I said, for the top end of, the, of, of, of our business. And we made an acquisition in the autumn, it's a business called Swipe Don, and that's very much entry level. I'll give you a bit more detail on that in just a second. Currently have 130 employees, well, 130 bodies, about 20 of those are actually um, offshore contractors based in the Ukraine. We've got four teams of five out there. Um, the rest then are deployed between the UK. There's about 20 people in New Zealand that came with that acquisition. And we've recently just uh, opened up an office in, in, in the US as well. We've got three people based there. Um, currently have just over 3,000 customers spread across 39 countries. A lot of those will actually, in fact, the vast majority will currently be swiped on. Um, we sell direct primarily, but we will, I'll talk in a second about um, partner sales. We'll, we plan to do a lot more on partners. And as I say, we've got two platforms, one aimed at mid-market and um, enterprise, the other one aimed at, um, at entry level, which is swiped on. The type of customers that we sell to, as I say, I've mentioned the three levels in the market, the entry level or self-serve, um, typical value will be £30 to £500 a month, 100% SaaS, okay, so they don't pay any upfront licenses, um, very fast sales cycle, uh, typically 14 days, and the customer gets themselves up and running. They don't require us to come in and, imp and, and supply consulting services. The mid-market is primarily SaaS, in fact, um, and the values range from 500 to 10,000 pounds a month. We've just done a deal in the States now, we just won the county of Fresno in California, and um, they're taking visitor management, meeting room management, and desk management from us, and that's worth $89,000 of ARR. So that's a typical mid-market deal for us. So it's not a, you know, a sensible number, 10 of those, and we're on to another million pounds of, uh, of good quality SaaS revenue. The enterprise ones then has all the characteristics as you'd expect at that end of the market. It can be spiky. There will be a propensity to buy license rather than SaaS because not, not everyone has swung across to that. Um, the sales cycle will be long. I mean, we've got deals now that we've been working on for a year and we're still pushing them along the, the sales pipeline. And the deployment can actually be extensive as well. Our single biggest customer in that space, we announced it in the autumn, is actually Standard Chartered Bank. Now we're deploying globally for them. They've got 86,000 employees. 2,800 meeting rooms, 650 floors that we had to map to create those wayfinding maps across, um, I think, and it's about six, potentially 1,600 locations. Um, we got the deal in October. We aim to go live on their platform. In, it's based in Chennai in South India. That's where their global uh, platform sits for, every, every, for everyone to access uh, globally uh, or from around the world. Um, and at that point, then it rolls out into the individual business units across their four regions. Um, deal value there we got it was made up of three park, three components. There was a license deal, 1.1 million. There was 500,000 pounds worth of services that included all the mapping, the deployment, the configuration. And then there's a SaaS component, which in the case of this business is actually going to be far in excess of the original license. Now the amount that we charge varies on the service that we provide. So our app, for example, as you saw on the screen there, um, Standard Chartered only plan to pay us, I think it's 38 cents per user per month. But when you take into account that there's 86,000 users, it starts to think actually this could actually be something. Um, we, our target price when we um, sell our desk management solution is 10 pounds per desk per month. Now that's what you'd pay if you're a sort of a mid-market client. A big client will tend to either beat us down in price or we'll offer a discount for, for, for a reason. A good example of that is UBS they pay us about £1.20 or £1.50 per desk. They were an early adopter, they've been a great reference site for us. Um, our job now is how we get that number back up again. But we start at £10 and it'll be in that £10 down to £1 range per desk per month. When it comes to managing meeting rooms, our target price is £20 per month. And then we'll work, again work down from that. If you're a, a business with 10 meeting rooms, you'll be paying us £20 a month. If you're a business with 2,800, you'll be paying considerably less than that, but we'll get it back in, in scale.
Okay, so that's sort of an example of the types of customers that, 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 that we work with. And as I say, the thing on, on the um, hospitality side is it, that number isn't going to grow, whereas here we expect, expect it to grow extensively in the, in, in the not-too-distant uh, future. In terms of what we've been up to for the last year, single biggest thing is um, in July we rebranded the business. We were called Redstone Connect. We became Smart Space Software, so it made it easier to de sort of describe what we do. We brought in that organization structure that I mentioned. We've invested a lot of money in software development. Got to remember, we've transitioned from being this um, unscalable software shop into creating a proper de dev organization. We've got about 60 people in wrong terms involved in software development across the business now. Now, 20 of those are contractors in the Ukraine. We pay about 250 pounds a day, which is equivalent to about 60,000 pounds a year. So comparable with the UK, in the past, in our effort to sort of get, get a bit of scale quickly, we used a lot of UK-based contractors. And our challenge, of course, was how much we were paying for them. And uh, we had some contractors who were paying £550 a day. We had 19 of those in the business in um, late last year. We're now down to three. So we've rebased that now. So in the UK now, the emphasis is on finding, um, you know, sensibly priced um, uh, developers, typically £50,000 to £70,000 a year. Um, we, as I say, mentioned some of those, those wins there in, the, in, in, in passing, that, that International Bank was obviously SCB and that phase one live was RBS. Um, something that's worth highlighting is a business called Avoco. Now Avoco are a partner of ours, they actually make those meeting room panels that you saw in the video. They're based in Sweden, they've got two to three hundred thousand deployments around the globe, sold through a network of 400 resellers. Now we, we've got to know that business through part of our business because we actually sell, we, we resell that product here in the UK um, and it's a key part. When we sell room management, we're interested in the software, but to actually make it really useful for the customer, having a panel on the outside is really important. Evoco are seen as, um, as the, at the top end of this panel market. They focus on the quality of the product and it does look much better. If you go into any Daimler office anywhere in the world, it'll be an Evoco panel will be sitting on the meeting room so that they, they're their exclusive panel provider. Um, We've, um, the, the network is really interesting. We've only engaged with a small number so far the, of the, their partners. And one that springs to mind is a partner that sits in Holland. It's a company called BIS, they're their Benelux partner. Um, we've just got a deal from the Dutch government. Now the first phase is only about 50, 60,000 pounds, I think it is. But actually, once we go through that phase, it's then extending out to the whole tax department and then to other government beyond that, or the government departments beyond that. If it wasn't for BIS and that Evoco partner, we would never have actually got in the door there. Okay, so that partner channel is really important to us. Our real motivation for being engaged with Evoco, though, is that we've reached an agreement to actually for them to resell our software. Now, they've got a current generation of product, which is the one that you saw on the screen there. And we've, uh, sometime over the summer, they're going to release that as a standard offering out through their channel partners to be sold across the globe. We basically get 40% of the SaaS revenue from that product. Now, we've been fairly conservative in our numbers as to what that can bring us, but you can imagine there's an extensive base there. And what our software does is takes what is a static panel on the wall that does very little. You've got to walk up to the panel and say, I am booking a meeting. If with our software, we can put it onto an app and it means that the person on reception can now manage the 20 meeting rooms remotely. So it suddenly makes their product far more compelling. They get a share of the ongoing revenue, but more importantly for us, we get access to 400 partners and that base of two to 300,000. The second phase of the Evoco relationship, um, we've been working on it since last year. And basically we've had, um, we've had two teams of developers basically building the firmware for their next generation of product. Um, that product will come out sometime this year. We saw the first one, the first um, off the production line about two weeks ago. So always a good news when you're dealing with a hardware manufacturer, the fact is actually produce something. Up until then we were sort of looking at uh, sort of 3D mock-ups and that. So it's good to know that that's on its way out. Now in that case, the model is slightly different. We get roughly 100 pounds for every panel that's shipped. And in addition, for any customers that take up the software components, and the components could be any mix of a, of a range of our modules there, but they'll be slightly cut down just to make them easy to deploy. So you know, a company that takes meeting rooms and maybe desk management and car parking and visitor could be spending four or 500 pounds a month. We get 40% of, um, of that revenue and it's on pure SaaS, okay? Now, the interesting thing about this is that their target to ship um, is, is 30,000 units per annum. So it's not, we're not talking about something that will sell a few hundred or a few thousand. 
Now, bear in mind that they're primarily a hardware business. They will be 100% focused on that. We know the channel quite well, and we know that they're capable of pushing it through. Now, that, that Evoco business, if we get it right and they deliver on what they promise, could have a scale, huge scale impact on what we do as a business because primarily it's the software that we're interested in. And it also gives us the basis then to have a solid uh, um, uh, distribution channel globally. And that BIS one is a very good example. They've got about 30 partners that are in the BIS category where they're proper system integrators. Not only do they sell the hardware, but they've got the tech, technical expertise to go and deploy as well. At the low end, they'll have a lot of people who simply just ship the product. But as those people ship the product and the client installs it on the wall, the first thing it does is hooks up to our server and says, which modules would you like to activate? And once we've got their payment details, then off they go from there. So very fast to deploy once we get it rolled out. Um, since we, um, since we uh, uh, finished our financial reporting period at the end of January, we've uh, achieved two milestones. One is we brought out version two of the Smart Space platform. We've been, Alex, who joined the CTO back in November, been rapidly sort of developing um, uh, the, the technology and evolving it from where we are. Um, and that sort of culminated in the V2 launch, which uh, again is a big milestone for us. And we also opened um, a small US office in Texas. Now, late last year, we sort of danced with one of our big competitors in the US, a business called Assure. They've got um, a 2000 uh, base customer or customer base, um, primarily in the US. Um, they got into some financial trouble. We made a cheeky approach to see if we could pick up the business on the cheap. We thought it might be worth 50 to, you know, 30 to $50 million. Um, they suggested $150 million. At the end of that, you can imagine the conversation was pulled up fairly short. But what it did, though, is get us excited about the business. I've since gone and hired the guy who used to be the COO of Assure, and the lady used to head up uh, small business sales, and they're now working out of a WeWork in, um, in, in Austin, in Texas. And um, the, from a standing start at the sort of beginning of March, we've, um, they've got about 21 active engagements right now with customers, and we've got our first two orders through the door. That county of Fresno that I mentioned earlier was one of them. So what it's showing to me, and I appreciate it's in a bit of a Petri dish right now, so we're still early days, but that the sales cycle in the US, it could actually be a lot shorter. And if we've got the right people who know the industry, and we've got low hanging fruit in terms of a 2000 base that actually are looking for something to migrate up to, it's got the ingredients to create a good business organically without the need to actually buy anything significantly, significant over there. And it also underlines the research that was showing us that the US market is growing we know it is. I mean, this week now, I know that our guys were in New York and we met with Perkins and Will, the big uh, international uh, architecture firm, and HBO. You know, we would never have got into those clients previously with just our resources from here. So uh, we keep a close eye on the US now over the next few months. If it's going well, we'll do more of it. If it's uh, not delivering what we want, we can, we, can, we can scale it back quite easily. So we're not overcommitted there in the sense of permanent offices and things. The Swiped On business started its, um, its journey in um, probably about um, July of last year. We acknowledged that we wanted to buy a visitor management solution and we wanted to buy something at the entry level. Now, entry level to us doesn't mean SME. It basically means someone who wants to buy a bit of software and get it up and running themselves. So if you go to Singapore now and you go to the regional headquarters of Danone, the French food company, it's our Swiped On product they use for visitor management. So that, that's what we mean by a customer at this end. Um, when we bought the business, they had 2,200 customers. By the end of January, we got it up to 2,700. And by the end of April, we were up to, um, I think we were up to um, uh, 3,063 customers. Um, we've grown the base by 35% since we bought it. And I know there was a lot of skepticism when we, uh, when we said to people we were going to buy this business, and it's in New Zealand, and it's a sort of, uh, it's a small SaaS business. But for us, really, I think this is one of the jewels in our crown. I know we're only six months in now, but you know, if we, we've got two, uh, two elements to our strategy for this business. One is to keep growing the, employee num uh, the customer numbers. Um, we know that when you look at the modeling that we did back last year, once we go above 3,500 customers, everything changes in that business. It starts to go cash positive and it makes, makes, it, makes us money. Um, we're now about three months away from that. We ha we're adding currently about 140 customers a month on average. Um, when we bought the business, um, the, the busiest ever month they had was 100 new customer signups. In January, we had 140 customers. That became our busiest month ever. And in March, we actually had 160 customers. And we had one day the week before last, we had 14 customer signups in one day. Um, and that's with no human interaction. 
The model is very simple. We do a lot of promotion through digital marketing, AdWords, Captera, <coughs> retargeting, etc. The aim is to get about 500 trialists each month, or e uh, each month, and our target then, and what we achieve is converting between 22 and 30 percent of those to paying customers. And that number is actually sustained um, over the last six months. When we bought the business, the cost of acquisition was $1,200, uh, our, uh, and our lifetime value is $6,700. Um, now our cost of acquisition is down to $825, I think it is, and our, um, and our lifetime ownership is up to, is up to 7,300, which is a ratio of about eight. In SaaS world, anything above three is seen as good. Um, our, um, the big thing for us then is churn. You know, if you've got a high, you could have a high growth business, but equally high churn, then you're not going anywhere. We churn, when the, we bought the business, they were churning 5.9% on revenue. We've now got that down to 5.3%. Um, and um, as a, the problem with churn is when they appear in your churn numbers, they're already gone. So you're probably not going to get them back. The big thing for us is net promoter score. Um, now, a good, a net promoter score, if you score positive on net promoter, is seen as good. Plus 20 is seen as really good. Plus 50 is seen as world class. Swipe down has never dropped below 60. A Apple have a net promoter score of 72. They're seen as the sort of bellwether of sort of the top end of the, of the net promoter score sort of uh, um, um, world. So um, really watching the customer service is key to that business. The second component to this business then that we want to drive on is increasing ARPU. When we bought the business, the ARPU, the average revenue per user, was running at $56 a month. We've now got it up to $62. And we achieved that by just changing the pricing model. I hope none of you are swiped on customers here, but all we did was on the front screen, we had the starter pack. Previously, it was capped at 50, um, 50 uh, um, not notifiers. So if, we, if, we're in, if we're in reception, you could notify up to 50 people to say your visitor is in reception. If you went to 51, it actually wouldn't allow you to send the 50, 51st message. We didn't change the software. We just changed the, the, the wording on the front page. And we've now brought the starter pack down to 25. And I was looking at some stats the other day now. We had, uh, I think we have 14 signups. And we know that, um, that uh, they went for the sort of $70, $70 a month package rather than the $30 a month package. Um, but we know that under the old regime, they'd, all, they'd have all gone with the starter package. Now that's given us an 8% uplift in ARPU already. We expect that when that runs out through the year, the ARPU will increase by 20%. The second thing we're doing on ARPU then is we're actually planning to introduce a range of new modules. Now, um, currently there's just one, it's just one module, which is visitor management. The next module, which is in development, we'll release over the summer is called deliveries. And that gives you a courier management capability at the reception. Someone turns up with your Amazon box, goes over, says he's a courier, it opens up the camera, takes a picture, scans the address label, and then recognizes you as because you're in the building and sends you a message to say your package is downstairs. Our target sell price on that is $30 per month. Now, coming from a base of $62 to $30, you can start to see the scale impact that actually has on the ARPU. Now, like any SaaS business with this, you've sort of got to cast yourself out beyond next year and the year after. We came out of Last financial year, the run rate was about um, 1.4 million pounds. We'll go out of this year, which is the end of January 2020, with a run rate of 2 million pounds. We'll have actually doubled it in size in, the, in, in this 12-month uh, period on the basis we keep the, uh, the, um, we keep the um, customer growth going. And we haven't really factored in a lot of this ARPU increase. Okay? Now, we expect that to double again the following year. The interesting thing that's happening, this graph's a little bit small here, is that currently we, we focus all our marketing efforts into five geographies. The US, where we've got 1,100 customers, the UK, 725, Australia, New Zealand, and Canada. We don't really spend money anywhere else, but without even trying, we've gone from having no customers in Holland to having 35. Now, um, I know I saw a report the other day, and on that report, it said we spent $200 in Google AdWords, just on, uh, just on Holland, that's all we spent and we've got 35 customers, but that's a non-localized product. We haven't actually translated into Dutch. And to me now, it's pointing us towards that we should actually be starting to cast our, um, cast our, our sort of ambitions wider than just those five core markets. And our, what we'd really like to do is start to get the new customer acquisitions up to two or 300 a month. The bigger base we have, the more base we can sell these add-on modules when we actually produce them. Our plan is to have about four add-on modules. We've got deliveries coming. We're going to have simple meeting room management, car parking, 
um, we're going to have event management and, uh, and desk booking. So basically what we're going to do at the low end, at the entry level end, is replicate what we've got at the top end. Now our sales guys go into a lot of businesses here in London and we leave them a quote for two or three thousand pounds a month. Much and all as they'd like the technology, the ROI just doesn't stack up. Now they for us are a perfect target for a swiped on offering at that end of the market. And we might be leaving a swiped on quote, or if they we introduce them to swiped on, they might end up paying two or three hundred pounds a month, which is you know six hundred dollars. But on a, an ARPU on a, an ARPU of sixty two dollars going to six hundred, the scale impact is huge. You know, so I suppose looking out two to three years beyond um, where we are now, there is no reason why this business couldn't be turning over seven or eight million and making to, making two to three million. Our costs aren't going to keep going up. We've got a, we might add two or three developers. We don't need any more bodies in marketing. And our big variable cost is our marketing spend. And we've, we've got a really good model now that we can crank the handle on as we go into new markets. And this probably is going to be one of the bigger, uh, biggest value drivers in the business. The problem is when you look at things like our N plus one note, a lot of it is only taking you out two years. So when you look to years three, three or four, um, it starts to get really, really interesting for, from a financial perspective. Um, one of the, our big competitors in the US is a business called Envoy. And Envoy have got 10,000 uh, customers versus our 3,000. And um, they raised some money back in the autumn and they were valued at $200 million. Now, even when you discount the silly valuations you get in the US, we paid 5.4 million for the, um, for the swipe down business. You know, and I reckon we can make that. I mean, our ambition is to take us from where we are now at sort of ADP up to five pounds. And it's having a business like this will be one of those key drivers. And at the same time, then taking our enterprise business with uh, our significant lumpy SaaS revenue that that brings. I'm thinking of one uh, engagement we're in at the moment now. And the SaaS component is £333,000 per annum. That's just from one client. So I need to do three of those. I've had another million pounds of SaaS. And then when you start to overlay that on to, uh, with, the, um, with the Avoco business, you can start to see then how, when you look at the, our, um, our forecast numbers, we're talking about going from 6.3 million to 11.4 million next year, how all of that starts to become possible. But more importantly, how SaaS becomes an increasing percentage of our overall, overall re revenues. And I really believe that having a blended revenue model like that, where we've got the high end, um, um, enterprise stuff, but we're not overly dependent on it. We've got good mid-market solutions, and then we've got maybe 150 customers being ad added every month at the low end. Combine all of those then, and we've got a model that's far more resilient than most of our competitors who are very much locked in the enterprise or mid-market end of the, of, 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 of the world we work in. Financial highlights, the main thing is that we're actually, we, we hit the numbers that Cantor's put out for us last year. When you look at the numbers at a headline level, you think 6.1 to 6.3 million, that 5%, is that our future? Definitely isn't. What you must take into account is that 6.1 million included two million pound license that we did, for, um, we did with um, Philips last year. It was a one-off OEM deal for an old version of our platform, and they were embedding it into some of their lighting systems. The market that they sell those lighting systems in are brand new build, build buildings. They're planning for projects now that won't even start um, building for three or four years. So it's a market that wasn't of interest to us. So on a like-for-like -like basis, you're really looking at the business gone from four million to six million. A big step change this coming year to uh, this current year to 11.5, and then on to 15 million. So okay, we've set ourselves some some uh, some stretching targets. Because we're investing so much, we're losing money. We lose 2.7 this year. The biggest up uh, increase in, uh, in cost there has been people in two areas, development and implementation. Um, the development, we took it from sort of, um, I think we had about um, 15 or 18 people. We've now got a total people of six involved in development across the group. Um, and then the other bit was we had to build an implementation team and create a methodology. You can't go and dance with someone like Standard Chartered Bank and talk about a global, uh, a global solution when we, what would have happened in the old days is one of the guys from Dev with a stained T-shirt would be would fielded as, um, as he, here's the guy who's going to deploy your, your solution. We've got a, uh, it's headed up by a really good experienced guy called Steve Batten. We've now got three or four really good project managers and, um, and a great team of consultants. Apologies for speaking so quickly, but uh, that was us in a big nutshell. Any questions? Sorry, sorry. could you just run through that, the maths on the Avoco yeah. um, JV? Uh, you're saying that you, they're, they, they look to install 30,000 units per year. No, this, this new generation product, the one that will release this year, 
they're targeting to sell 30,000 units of that per annum. Okay, and, and you hope to get 500 million, and they, they would hope to get 500 million, 500, sorry, $500 per month of software recurring revenues per unit, yeah. yeah? Yeah, there's two components for that product. The product is actually called NASO, even though they haven't publicized it yet. So for NASO, we get a hundred pounds roughly one-off uh, fee for each one that's shipped. So whether the customer just sticks it on the wall, we get £100 for that. So I think it's €130, I think, is the the last number I saw from them. Then if that customer takes that panel and says, I'd like to introduce meeting room, I'd like to introduce uh, desk management, depending on the permutation that they would actually take, it could range from anything from sort of £50 a month to five or £800 a month. And sitting in there, then we get basically 40% of that gross revenue. But if you could, can you then model thirty thousand units times yeah three hundred pounds a month yeah that that times and, and as you'd expect then for us we haven't we well thirty thousand is their target we have a number that's considerably less than that for the purposes of our our modelling just to be conservative have Cantors modelled that as well Cantors haven't but N plus one have and I actually it's in the N plus one note so they've done quite they've seen a bit more information around it. So, um, but I, you know, it's, um, the, the numbers on it are, are great simply because we've got no cost of sale and every penny that we get back from, um, uh, from Evoco is 100% uh, margin to us. Acquisitions are part of our strategy, but we don't plan to be a buy and build play. We will make one or two other acquisitions, but it's got to be the right business with the right fit at the right value. And um, we'd like to think that's sort of swiped on as an example of the kind of deal that we can do. Sounds like it's been a very good acquisition. Touch wood it has, yeah. And, you know, the fear, and we wanted to give it prominence. We're just finishing our investor roadshow at the moment and we put it sort of front of house when we spoke to people because I've been there on the other side and whenever you hear acquisitions, what you're waiting for is the bad news. You know, it wasn't as good as we thought it was. We're going to have to spend money restructuring it. It'll now make a contribution in year three or four. What we would to illustrate here is that this business had momentum and we've been able to follow it on. Ladies and gentlemen, we've run out of time for questions, I'm afraid. Thanks very much. Thank you, Frank. Thanks.